Good evening, I'm Savannah Kelly and welcome to APTN National News. A school at the Sturgeon Lake First Nation near Prince Albert, Saskatchewan has a land-based education program for its kindergarten to grade 12 students. The program is aimed at getting back to the old Nihayo traditions that were taken by the community by colonization and residential schools. Brent McGillivray has this story for us. Our young people being taken away from from their homes to these residential schools as children. They lost their identity. They lost their culture. We didn't have this. Tanya McCollum takes this man's words to heart. She is a K-12 teacher at the Sturgeon Lake First Nation Central School, a school with more than 400 students. She started with the land-based curriculum six years ago, bringing with her extensive knowledge in academics and her lifelong experience on the land. I was raised by my grandparents right from an infant, so the first few years of my life was uh, out on the land, so it was informal education. So a lot of things that, uh, uh, that I know how to do was observing my grandmother or my grandfather. You know, my grandmother was the product of the Indian residential school system, so she was very quiet. She didn't like to talk because that's, uh, that's um, trauma from the residential schools. Tanya's teaching combines Nieho and Western knowledge and a healthy helping of food sovereignty. My education is based on the Western ways of doing things and the indigenous ways of doing things. So weaving those two together makes the team stronger. And that's what we try and do at our school is we try and uh, not one worldview is the way. Introducing the students to food that comes from the land, the education is taught inside and outside the classroom. When we first started cutting meat or pulling out fish from the lake, they were all grossed out and um, that's changed. The students are taught how to identify plants and animals and how local hunters bring meat to the school. They're starting to realize that uh, land and the food um, are the core of what we are as indigenous people and they've had great respect for, um, for the animals and the plants. When we talk about um, working from a land-based paradigm and when we start talking about food sovereignty, that uh, certain plants and animals, um, they have to have that spiritual connection. Not only is Tanya busy teaching inside and out of the classroom, she does the same on Facebook for everyone to access and learn from. Many uh, non-Indigenous people are my followers. You know, they ask me questions and it's good in a way because uh, they know about our way of life and they want to know more. And then when, when they learn about our culture, there's, um, it mitigates racism. So um, I think uh, with reconciliation, um, I think land-based is the way to go when we want to indigenize our curriculums. Land-based is one of the ways. Leonard Ermine and other local elders visit the school once a week. They share their knowledge with the students of the ways that were taken away from them when they were forced into residential schools. Leonard says the elders feel very fortunate to have Tanya and traditional knowledge being brought back. With the truth and reconciliation, we're beginning going back. We say, escape not soon, like what this woman is doing. We're going back to Mother Earth, going back to the old ways that our people and that lived, the way our people took care of us, the way our people fed us. These are things in Napa. Brent McGillivray, APTN National News, Sturgeon Lake First Nation, Saskatchewan. The University of Winnipeg is equipping the next generation of Indigenous language teachers with a new virtual program. The program is called Teaching Indigenous Languages for Vitality Certificate. It gives speakers of Indigenous languages the requirements to teach their own language and create future programs. The certificate's 10 courses are taught in English and applicable to any Indigenous language. Heather Souter is an assistant professor and Michif speaker. She co-developed the program. Our language is critically endangered as many, I should say, you know, many Indigenous languages across Canada, North America and around the world. We have very few speakers left and so teaching Michif, even though I'm a second language learner myself, is part of what one has to do in language revitalization. 
November 16th marked 138 years since the execution of Louis Riel, the leader of the Métis and founder of Manitoba who fought for his nation's rights and identity. In Winnipeg, Manitoba Métis citizens gathered around Louis Riel's gravesite and laid wreaths to pay tribute to him. Riel led two resistance movements against the Canadian government and played a major role in preserving Métis language and culture. Manitoba Métis Federation Minister of Housing Will Goodon led the wreath-laying ceremony. It's this idea of understanding uh, what it means to be courageous, uh, what it means to be, you know, he didn't ask to be a hero, but we needed one and uh, he, he became that for all of us and, and, and in spite of the overwhelming odds, uh, he knew that it was um, the right thing to do, to stand up for what was right. For the first time in history, Mitchiff was spoken in the Red Chamber. Last month, Métis Senator Yvonne Boyer delivered a speech in that language, which is a combination of French and Cree or Ojibwe. Mira, Saskatchewan, Pela Rivière Rouge, Donnelly, Manitoba. The speech Mia. honored her Saskatchewan-born Red River Métis cultural roots. It highlighted the inclusion of Indigenous peoples and promoted language revitalization. Today it needed to be done because we're starting a new day today where Michif is going to be the front and center with the language and the culture and the children need to know that. They need to know, they need to hear it in the Senate of Canada because if it's, if it's heard here, it can be heard everywhere. Atikamek is the only language to gain more speakers in Quebec among First Nations between 2016 and 2021, according to data released this summer. Two years ago, the Atikamek Nation released an Atikamek French dictionary to promote the language. Now the community has created a new thematic dictionary that focuses on the culture. Here is Maricela Amador with more. If you travel into any of the three Atikamek communities in Quebec, you will hear the language spoken everywhere by leaders, by elders, and by the youth. And the numbers don't lie. Recent data from Statistics Canada shows that not only is the Tikamek one of the strongest languages in Quebec, but also one of the fastest growing. And now the nation continues its conservation efforts with the launch of a thematic Tikamek French dictionary. Le but premier c'était pour nos jeunes justement les outils pour qu'ils puissent avoir un outil de référence là, à ce qui concerne la langue Atikamekw. Nicole Petsiké is a language coordinator at the Council for the Atikamekw Nation. She says the new dictionary contains more than 220 themes and sub-themes oh, focused je... on traditional knowledge. Et pour euh, léguer là, euh, la, la, la richesse là, de la langue Atikamekw, de plus que la langue Atikamekw est l'une des langues les plus parlées là, au Canada, this is the second dictionary produced by the nation. They released an Atikamek French dictionary in 2021. Both projects were done in collaboration with Dr. Mario Dill Juncker, a linguistics professor from Carleton University. In the time of climate change, I think humanity is really looking for uh, a new way to envision their place in the world, in nature, as a species. And languages like Atikamek have some interesting uh, pointers, indication of how to do that. Juncker says the Atikamek Council first reached out to her in 2013 with the idea of enshrining the language through a dictionary. There is a, a lot of richness and mandatory richness indicated in the lexicon about, I would say, the place of human in nature, not outside. The 2021 volume contains over 13,000 words and is a hit with both students and teachers from the communities of Manawan, Opitsiwan, and Wamotasi, where Pitikwe is from. Puis quand on fait la tournée des, 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 des communautés faire la promotion pour la langue, on voit là dans leurs yeux là, qui ont comme euh, ils ont le goût d'apprendre. Je connais une des enseignantes moi, qui m'a dit moi je travaille beaucoup beaucoup avec ça. Toutes les, les, les questions que je me posais moi à moi-même sont toutes là. Creating this important reference material required collaboration with elders, a situation complicated by the pandemic. Now that they're published, Petitquet says that the dictionaries give the communities a sense of belonging. Notre langue là, est, est très précieuse puis est très riche 
qu'il faut faire de quoi là, pour vraiment là, le, le transmettre à nos jeunes. Étant donné aussi que nos jeunes parlent encore la langue, nos tout petits, là, tout petits aussi. Enfin, enfin, on a quelque chose, là, on a des outils là, de référence qu'on peut les prendre dans les mains. Maricela Amador, APTN National News, Montréal. We need to take a short break. When we come back, a new program is helping Casca peoples in southeastern Yukon revitalize their language. Welcome back to APTN National News. Over a thousand elders from across Canada were in Edmonton for the 2023 National Gathering of Elders in November. The goal is to share wisdom and to keep up lifetime learning. ABTN's Chris Stewart has more. It was a sight to see. Elders from all parts of the country together in one place. The Edmonton Expo Centre is the home of the 2023 National Gathering of Elders from October 30th to November 2nd. It's an opportunity to make new friends, hear new languages, and learn about different Indigenous cultures. Each day showcases new offerings. This day held seminars on justice, health and wellness, children and family, language and culture, and climate change. Ethel Straker is from Barron's River First Nation in Manitoba. She says the sessions she attended had an impact on her. I've attended the climate change uh, session and that's something else <laughs> and uh, the other one was uh, truth and reconciliation and that's another emotional one and uh, it's so hard listening to people like their experiences and how how it affected us judy sartrand is also from barons river first nation she enjoyed learning more about other indigenous cultures. It's very interesting and very knowledgeable from other aspects of the different tribes that have spoken in language and the culture. And I just came from the health and wellness. That's an interesting program as well. Brian Kachich is from Soto First Nation in Saskatchewan. He is looking forward to teaching others what he has learned. It has been very overwhelming to see all these elders together. It's been it's a very beautiful experience. Uh, it's very insightful. It's a good refresher course of what's to come in the next future generations of what we have to teach them and what they have to learn. It wasn't just all discussions. There was a cultural showcase and a hand games demo that brought out the crowd. The event wraps up on Thursday. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. Like many other nations across Turtle Island, Casca peoples in southeastern Yukon are eager to revitalize their language. Now, a new program is helping them do just that. Here's Sarah Connors with that story. Emerald Pope's life mission is to be fluent in her native Casca language, and with help from elders, she's getting there. Pope is one of five students enrolled in a new full-time Casca language training program in the community of Upper Lee Yard. It has an ambitious goal, teach young speakers language fluency so they can eventually pass down the language themselves. There's so much need in the community for language, um, not only for it to be visible, but for people to be able to like teach it. Today's lesson, high tanning in the Casca language. <laughs> it takes a mix of classroom learning and community input, with elders providing wisdom and language. How do you say it? Three times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The one-year program is administered by the Yard First Nations Language Department. In addition to classroom work, elders work one-on-one -on -one with students to hone in on the language. 
All of them here want these students to succeed. Maybe in the future some of them could be language teachers in the school. People wanted to see traditional parenting program or programs for expecting mothers um, and all that in the language. Just knowing the contributions that our elders make and just like that they're willing to come here to help us and like just can't really ignore that. The significance of saving an endangered language hasn't been lost on the community's last speakers. Jocelyn Wolftail knows it well. Once prevented from speaking her language at residential school, she knows how it feels to be lost without it. It's why she lends her time to the program. Without your language, you lose your culture. So while they're doing language, they're learning culture too at the same time. Like making moose hide and stuff like that. So they're, it's all coming back, which is the best part. <laughs> but it hasn't been without challenges. A lack of housing in the community forced one student to drop out, and a fuel leak in the program's building forced it to be moved to a community hall. Funding, which comes through the First Peoples Cultural Council, is tedious to secure and may be cut next year. Uh, and if that happens, I mean, that's going to be detrimental to our program. We cannot continue based on, I don't know, 40% of the funding that we have right now. As it is, we don't have enough uh, for what we want to do. So, While Pope says a year isn't hardly long enough to be fluent, she does have hope for the language and herself. With three years of learning under her belt, she's never felt more grounded. When you learn another language, you see, like, the world through that language. So that's how I'm sort of trying to reconnect and, I guess, maybe reconnect with my ancestors. Yeah. Now it's up to young speakers like Pope to pass down what she's learned so the next generation can thrive. And because, because I know the benefits of it, yes, I would like to share that with everybody else because I know that they benefit from it as well. <laughs> Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Upper Liard. We need to take one more quick break. Still to come, a wampum exhibit in Montreal has a history that spans more than four centuries. Welcome back to APTN National News. Language and culture go hand in hand, and Lena Evick fights for it every day. She's one of the founders and the president of the Pruvik Center, an adult Inuit language learning center in Nunavut's capital. Trevor Wright reports. The Pruvik Center, primarily located in Iqaluit, has been around in one form or another since 2004. Lena Evick says she has always been an ardent supporter of keeping Inuktut or Inuit languages alive. And it was my passion to speak it. I believed then and I still believe today that as indigenous cultures around the world we have inherent right to, to teach in our language, to learn in our language, to grow in our language. Evick says elders are an essential in teaching younger generations of Inuit in Nuuktut. We have to get it from our older generations. And so that's, that's just one of the mo uh, important and significant, you know, um, reasons why we bring in our elders. Yeah. And they are the greatest professors, I can tell, um, like I've ever had myself, yeah. She says it's never too late to pick up a book and start learning. Whatever we start today can always have a positive ripple effect down the road. But if we maintain it, if it continues to get the right support, uh, we're actually creating a better tomorrow for our Inuit young generations. What would help in keeping indigenous languages alive, says Evik, is institutional recognition and support. It re really needs the structural grounding that it needs by being recognized at all levels of, you know, governance structures and being one of official languages of Canada. We cannot always be served in our Inuktut language here in our own territory because French and English uh, are official languages and they come first. 
Keeping Indigenous languages alive in Canada for Evic is an important step to reconciliation. Making the wrong right really, really is big on Indigenous languages in my view. Trevor Wright, APTN National News, Iqaluit. Wampum Beads of Diplomacy is a new exhibit at the McCord Stewart Museum in Montreal. The collection includes a history that spans more than four centuries and brings together over 40 wampum belts from public and private institutions in Quebec, Canada and Europe. Maricela Amador has more. Casser les, les, les coquillages et ensuite les, les éroder et ensuite les percer. The new exhibit sheds light on the powerful, cultural, and political symbolism of wampum belts. These significant objects made from shell beads were exchanged between nations, including European nations, during diplomatic meetings. Jonathan Laney, the curator of the exhibit, is from the Huron-Wendat nation. He said that these belts of truth convey messages that were meant to be preserved. These wampum are um, very often the evidence or the witness of past alliances and agreements and treaties. So to say that to me is basically saying that these belts are at the foundation of the Canada that we know today. The exhibit aims to make wampum belts visible and accessible to all. The collection features objects from the Museum du Quai Branly Jacques Chirac in Paris, which co-developed the exhibit. Emmanuel Casarirou, the president of Musée du Quai said the research shows that some of the belts given to Europeans ended up in cabinets of curiosity and private museums overseas since the 17th century. Et qu'il est important pour nous, Musée du Quai Branly, de retourner vers les, euh, les communautés d'origine. Et le McCord fait un travail très important depuis très longtemps avec les communautés d'origine. Et c'était l'occasion aussi d'essayer de, de tresser de nouvelles paroles autour de ces, de ces wampum. A wampum belt presented by the Mohawk community of Kanesadage to Pope Gregory XVI is also on display. It has been held by the Vatican since 1831. The original belt was made around 1721. Hilda Nicholas is from Kanesadage and heads the community's language and cultural center. She said that seeing the exhibit was both awesome and emotional. Because you think back throughout the history of all the things that's happened to our people, and here we have in front of us uh, these beautiful belts uh, made by women, they said. Nicholas explained that Laney approached the community to collaborate in the exhibit. She recorded the exhibition story in Ganyangeha. A picture of Chief Sose Swan from Knesadage wearing the two dog wampum belt is prominently displayed on a poster that adorns the museum's facade. So proud, and I still have uh, goose pimples because it's, it's so exciting, and we're so proud that um, uh, Chief Sose uh, Onasakona, Joseph Swan, uh, was the chief. He was a very brilliant man. The exhibition will be on display until March 2024. Maricela Amador, APTN National News, Montreal. And that's all the time we have for you tonight on APTN National News. I'm Savannah Kelly, and from all of us here, Marcy, Miigwech, and thank you for joining us. Take care and have a great night.